Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and we are back with another Amazon gadget haul. I got another box of stuff here that I've been getting in over the last couple of weeks and I know a lot of you enjoyed the last haul that we did. So I've got some cool stuff in here that I think might be fun to look at. So we're gonna get into this in just a second, but I do wanna let you know in the interest of full disclosure that all of these things came in free of charge through the Amazon Vine program. However, nobody is reviewing or approving what you're about to see before it is uploaded. This is not a sponsored review and none of the manufacturers here had any direct contact with me either. So let's get into it now and see what we've got in the box. All right, let's start off with the most visible item in the box here, which is another one of these Red Dragon keyboards. Last time we got one that was very compact. This one is also pretty compact, but it has a full layout here. So let's open this up. I haven't opened this yet at all. And let's see what is inside. So we will first remove the keyboard component itself and feels like it's got a nice uh, clicky feel to it. One of the things that Red Dragon produces uh, quite nicely actually are mechanical keyboards that have a lot of that tactile feel for a lot less money than what you would normally pay. This one doesn't feel as good as some of the other ones I've looked at from them. So here's an overhead view of the keyboard. This is backlit and I'll plug it in in a second so you can see what it looks like. My big gripe with this, and I think the reason why I'm saying it doesn't feel as good as some of the other ones, is that the key travel here is not as deep as I think some of their other keyboards are. I might be mistaken, and it might just be the key switch they chose for this, but again, the travel doesn't feel all that great, but you do get that mechanical feel and a little bit of a click. They call these red switches, but they're not cherry red switches, of course. So this is the keyboard component. It does have to be plugged into your computer with a USB-A connector here. And then they give you some other stuff in the box here, including some key pullers. And they also give you some extra switches here too. So we can take a look at what those switches look like here. And here is the switch itself. And again, you get four of these packed in the box in case one of them breaks on you. And I am not sure who makes these. So perhaps some of my keyboard aficionados will let me know about that. But there's some software that you can use to configure this, unlike some of the other Red Dragon keyboards. Let me get my computer out and we'll see how it works. All right, so here is the Sindri software that you can use to configure the keyboard. Now you might be accustomed to software that you get with Razer or the Logitech keyboards where you have a lot more control over the lighting. This one is fixed in its light assignment. In other words, there are uh, different colors on the keyboard but the number pad here is always red. I can't change the color. What I can do is I can go into this menu here and select like a different pattern that it can follow. So if I hit the H key here, it'll light up as I'm typing. But as you can see here, all the keys are the same color as they were before. So you have a little bit of a choice as to how your keyboard looks and how the lights work, but not any kind of per key function here, at least in so far as um, the color of the light that it displays. But it's got some neat modes to it, and for the price, it's not a bad uh, little option here. The keyboard backlight, though, is a bit dim. We've got our, our lights off here in the studio, and you can see it doesn't light up all that brightly, and I do have it on the highest setting. One other note is that you can go through and set specific macros to run on individual keys. So, for example, if I hit the 2 here, I can assign it a different key when I push that key if I want, I can also have a macro run here, and then we can also maybe have it play some media or something instead of the key's normal function. But you don't have any extra macro keys on here, so you'd have to um, work in a function key or something like that. But pretty neat for its price. You do have some minimal controls here on what the keyboard can do. You can set different profiles. It is backlit, and I think for the price point, not bad if you're looking for something a little better than a membrane keyboard. And if I had a choice between this and some generic membrane keyboard, I'd probably pick this one. All right, next up here is a PoE switch. This is a, a gigabit switch. And what I found interesting about it is that it's designed to be outside. Normally with power over ethernet, you use that functionality to bring low voltage wiring from the inside to the outside this device will power your PoE outside. And here is what it looks like. So you've got kind of a weatherproof compartment here. And let me open this up if I can, and we'll see what's inside. I'm guessing this is where all of your ethernet cabling goes. 
and there we go. And let's pop it open. All right, so this is interesting. Um, the power cord and the power adapter are kind of built into the casing. And I don't actually see a way in which you could service the power supply on this if it were to fail. So that's something. And of course, you'll need to find some weatherproof place to plug this in. And the power cable isn't all that long. So I kind of question that uh, whole <laughs> idea there. Um, also, I'll show you the other view here. And I got to read the instructions for this switch. But you've got um, basically your uplink port here. This is gigabit. And then you have uh, 10, 100, or gigabit PoE ports on this side. And while I plug this in and figure it out, I am going to get out a couple of PoE devices and see if this can power them. All right, so we've got it plugged in now. I do have it connected to the rest of my network. And I also have two NDI uh, cameras here that work over PoE. So why don't we plug in the more power-consuming one here first. And we'll plug that into one of the PoE ports on the switch. Now the switch supports uh, 802.3 AF and AT, so I think that's PoE plus. And if I plug this into the right port, which I didn't, <laughs> we will see uh, the camera here power up hopefully. It has a total power budget of 78 watts and it can deliver 30 watts per port. And here you can see the first camera powering on, so that's a good sign. And now I'll plug the other one in here and see if we can draw two cameras here at the same time. And I guess what they're kind of focusing on as a design choice with this device is that if you've got a single Ethernet cable going out to a spot where you want to have four different cameras, you can power all of them from the switch and then kind of home run it back that way. You can't power the switch though with PoE, but it looks like both cameras here have successfully connected. And maybe what I'll do real quick is see if we're getting a signal over the network from one of these cameras. And uh, yeah, it's working. So we're getting video and we're getting power uh, on two different cameras here. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, so I, I would love to hear from people as to whether or not this is a product that has some utility. I've never really heard of bringing your whole switch outside because I would just run more cable out. Um, but I guess if you had a need for something, this would probably accomplish it. But once that power supply goes, you're going to have to rip the thing apart to swap it out. All right, this next item is from Pluggable. They make all sorts of cool stuff. This is a USB-C extension cable that has a power meter built in. And this will support up to 240 watts, they say. So that's cool. So it looks like the meter is on the cable itself here. And what you've got is a male USB-C connector, and then this one is female because this is an extension cable. So what we're going to test here with this is to see how it works with this little mini PC that you'll see a review of on my channel shortly. And depending on when I upload this one, maybe you'll have already seen it. So this is the B-Link Sur 7. It's actually a really cool mini PC. And I can power it over USB Type-C. So I'm going to plug in the male connector there. And then I have my power cable here on the floor. So I'm going to connect up my power. And we're getting a signal here from the power connector. That's cool. And we'll see what happens when I power the computer up. And there you go. So you can see that it's drawing uh, 15 watts here. So it looks like it's kind of going in real time. It just reset itself, though. <laughs> That's not a good sign. <laughs> Let's try it again. This may not be for powering your computer. It might be better off for powering a phone or something. But there you go. You get a feel for how that works. But you should also be mindful of not creating too long of a cable. USB has varying degrees of maximum cable length, depending on how much power you're pushing through it and how much data you're running through it. And you'll want to just be very careful to not exceed those lengths based on the use case. I did uh, switch my cable out and my mini PC. This one requires a little less power than the other one we were just looking at. And so this one has been able to uh, run itself here without issues. So yeah, it's kind of neat. I think it's probably better in more in the realm for phone charging than it is for powering a PC, but it's kind of cool to have a connector on there. I would have preferred this just be a single male-to-male -male cable, and maybe they offer one of those. But if you were looking to monitor your 
phone's power consumption or some other low powered device, this one might be a good way to do it. Just make sure the cable you're plugging in for that extension is not all that long. And on the topic of cables, we've got another cable to take a look at. This one a little less high tech, but worthy of discussion. This is the Starlinker Thunderbolt 4 cable. Why I am including this here is that it's a bit longer than most of the Thunderbolt cables that I have looked at in the past. It's 10 feet, which is pretty long for a Thunderbolt cable. What I question with this cable though, is that although they're using the Thunderbolt label here and essentially claiming certification, I did check with the Thunderbolt people and this is not currently one of the cables that they have certified. One of the things they said is that sometimes manufacturers jump the gun and start selling things before the certification is completed. The other thing that's going on right now is that USB has adopted the Thunderbolt standard for USB 4. So you're going to start seeing a lot more cables like this one that either flat out call themselves a Thunderbolt cable but are not approved to call themselves that. Or you're going to have a cable that says they're a USB 4.0 40 gigabit cable which will work on Thunderbolt devices, but did not go through the certification process. So just be aware of some of the nuances of Thunderbolt cables and how those relate to USB. It just gets more and more complicated every day. But I did want to see though, because this is certainly the longest Thunderbolt cable, if it is indeed a real one, that I have ever tested before. And I've got my Thunderbolt hard drive out here. And I wanted to do a quick test just to see if this cable can uh, deliver proper data speeds at this length. So let me get it hooked up and let's see. All right, so here we go. We've got the cable now plugged into the Samsung drive. And full disclosure, the Samsung drive came in free of charge through the Amazon Vine program a little while back. Uh, it was designed by Porsche and it has automotive paint on it. It looks pretty cool. They don't make this anymore, but it was super fast. And this is only going to work with a Thunderbolt compatible computer and cable. So that's why I chose this for the demo here. So let's pull up my Blackmagic disk speed test. It did find the drive when I plugged it in. So that's a good sign. And here we go. We're getting pretty much the speeds that I would expect out of this drive. We're pulling about two and a half gigabytes per second on the reads, 2.3 to be exact. So it, it looks like maybe just slightly slower than what I typically see with this, but it could just be some variations on the PC that I have it plugged into. So for all intents and purposes, it is working at the advertised speed. It is a long cable here, three meters or 10 feet, but it does appear to be providing uh, the proper uh, data rate here for the drive that's plugged into it. So there you go, it does work and uh, how it works over the long term, I will let you know. On to the next item. All right, this next one is for iPhone users that have an iPhone with the MagSafe connector. This is on the surface, a stand for your phone. I was hoping it would be a little bit more compact and compatible for traveling because I'm always looking for something to take on the plane with me. It feels though pretty nicely constructed. It's got some metal here for that part and you can see that this thing just came off and I'll show you why in a second. Um, but it has some nice construction to it and you can extend it out a little bit as well. It's kind of, kind of tough to do it right now. Um, but what happens here when you um, put your phone on it, if you've got an Apple phone with that MagSafe connector on it, like this iPhone 14, uh, you will be able to have it stick to it. And if you're on a plane or something or just sitting at your desk, you can you know, watch TV or whatever like this. Um, the other thing it does, it doesn't charge your phone by the way, it's just a stand, is that when you pull this component off, apparently you can have it rest on your MacBook's display so you can use your phone as a webcam. Let's take a look at that. Now you may not know this, but if you have an iPhone that's paired up with your Mac, it will give you the option when you're selecting a camera in most applications to use the iPhone as the camera. And so we have the thing that we pulled off of the stand a second ago. And I've got my camera here from the iPhone running in that mode. And what I can do here is just place it down on top of the Mac. And now I've got a much higher quality webcam. Surprisingly, it's not weighting down my display as much as I thought it would. And it kind of works actually. So it's nice. You can get your you know, super high quality camera from your iPhone to work as a webcam. And it's not even covering up the bezel here, nor is it weighing too heavily down on my Mac screen either. So that looks really good. I'm surprised by how well that works. Now, apparently what you can do with this thing also is, whoops, is pop the magnet out by pushing your thumb through it. And you can replace the magnet that they give you 
with a compatible charger like the Apple charger. So you could turn this into a charger and actually keep it charged while it's doing video synchronization to your phone. So pretty neat little stand, very well constructed and uh, kind of a neat thing if you're looking for a fun little iPhone stand that works with MagSafe. All right, this one I think is kind of useful for those of you looking for a multifunction device. This is from a company called Benfee. And what they've integrated here is a USB hub and a gigabit ethernet port. And what's nice about this is you have a choice of connectors. So you can use your USB-A connector or a USB-C. And this would be really great with like an, uh, you know, an Android phone or something, and I, maybe even the iPads now, and of course the iPhones when they switch over to USB-C. Let me plug this in to my PC here real quick and we'll see how it works. All right, so I've got it connected now to a PC here. I'm using the USB-C port. Plugged into the USB hub, I have a mouse here, which is working, so that's great. And why don't we test the uh, ethernet speed here? So we'll click connect here. What I'm expecting to see is about eight or 900 megabits per second, which is what you typically get out of a gigabit ethernet adapter. And sure enough, we're getting exactly what I anticipated, about 950 megabits per second, basically a gigabit ethernet thing here working at full speed. And the upstream is pretty much the same as well. One thing you have to be careful about with these is that they can certainly take a mouse dongle like I've got plugged into it right now, but more heavy power consuming devices like hard drives and things that might need more power could be problematic. So just be careful what you plug into it. If you are gonna use a hard drive, I would get one that has its own power supply just to be safe. But this is a great way to connect up a couple of different devices to an Android phone or a tablet or iPad, for example, and get ethernet at the same time, good stuff. All right, here's something interesting. As you may or may not know, Apple has been licensing their AirTag technology to other companies. Some companies integrate it into their products like bikes and that sort of thing, but this is a competing AirTag that costs a little bit less, but is licensed, at least according to the no-name manufacturer on it, by Apple. So it should work with the Find My Network. And why I found this interesting is that although it's not all that less expensive versus an AirTag, you don't need a special holder to use it because it's got that uh, little hanging thing here built in by default. So it's a, it's a little easier to attach it to a pet or something like that because it doesn't need any accessory items to do it. And like the Apple AirTag, you just heard a beep there. Um, it is powered by a battery that is replaceable, so you just have to pry it open and swap out the battery every couple of months, and they give you a little spudger here, actually, to do that. And then you also get a little strap that you can use to hang it around something. So I just thought that was kind of nice. It's a lot smaller than its picture looks. When I saw the picture on Amazon, I thought it was this big, huge tag, but it's actually quite small. I might attach this to my dog or something like that. Um, so pretty cool. So let me get this uh, paired up with my phone and let's see if it works like an AirTag. All right, I got it to pair up with my phone. I'm calling this one dog. Maybe I'll attach it to my dog a little bit later. And when you pair this up, what's important to note here is that you have to select the other item option, not the AirTag, because this is not an AirTag. It is an other item that's been licensed. And the big difference here between this and an AirTag is that when you want to try to find the device when you're looking for it in the house somewhere, um, what'll happen on an official AirTag is that you have this thing here that says find and it will have your phone go out and look for it and you can move the phone around and see if it can track it down with its ultra wideband radio. This tag doesn't support that. So it's gonna be a little harder to find. You're gonna have to rely upon the um, sounds that it makes to track it down. So as you can see here, the dog option just gives me directions to where it was last seen, but I'm not gonna be able to do that uh, ultrasonic thing that you can do when you're in the home or the ultra wideband mode. It can though play a sound. I can put lost mode on it and it will then communicate with iPhones around the world to uh, pinpoint its location. So it has most of the features of the AirTag, but not all of them. And the big feature that's missing here is the uh, ultra wideband detection that's built into some of the higher end and newer iPhones. But it is less expensive, especially when you look at its entry cost and the fact that you don't need an extra accessory to hang it off of something. All right, this next item is a rugged NVMe M.2 SSD enclosure. 
So let's open it up here and see what we got. I'm not sure if this is waterproof necessarily, but we'll see. And it does look pretty cool though, doesn't it? So it's got this nice rubber surrounding it. It's, it feels like a solid block of metal. It does not though come with the hard drive. You have to supply your own, but lucky for you, I've got one on the desk here that we'll install here in a second. It does have screws that have to be removed to put the hard drive in. So hopefully that screwdriver is included and it is. So let me uh, get the uh, case here opened up and we'll install a hard drive in it and see how it performs. All right, so I got the screws undone, not too hard to do. Nice big thick metal piece here. And then inside we've got another package and I believe this is gonna be our little heat thing that we're gonna to attach to the hard drive that we're going to put into it. And this will transfer heat from the NVMe drive to the outer case, which is what you want there. And you'll notice too that we've got two sets of screws here inside of it. And these depend on what size NVMe that you're installing. So the one that I'm installing is a full length drive, so I don't need that screw. And I think, let's see, I think I may have to take that screw out to get it working, but I've got this WD drive that I bought a little while back. And I'm just gonna pop it in there. Yeah, I gotta take that screw out. So let's take that screw out and then we'll get the drive attached to it when we put it back in. So we're gonna put that in here like that, press it down. All right, so it looks like this screw's got a little groove in it and they want the groove to sit in between the hard drive. So I gotta open it up a little bit to make that fit. So let me adjust the screw here and then we'll get it all installed. Um, the reason is, is that it has to stand, sit up a little bit higher because there, there are, there's metal all over the bottom of this thing here. So you don't want it resting on that metal there. Okay, so I got it installed. It was a little trickier than I think it should be. They should have had one of those little rubber things that it could attach to, but it's in, it's in properly and we're good to go. Uh, one last thing I've got to do here for proper thermal control is put the thermal heat spreading thing here on there. And so it's a nice big thick thing. I'll put it down on top like that and that'll get the heat transferred properly. And then we put the metal back on top here and then I've got to screw it all back together. So let me screw it back together. We'll plug it into the PC and we'll see how fast this drive will perform. Now, when I was getting ready to connect this to my PC, I was curious where the cable was. It turns out the cable is right here. They kind of made it look like a carabiner. Um, the problem with the cable though is that it comes out very easily here. So you're not going to want to use this cable to hang this off of something. I think it'll get lost very quickly. So you're going to want to find a different way to hang it off your bag. This cable is not the way to do it, but points for cleverness there. Um, so what I'm going to do here is just connect this up to the USB type C port on this uh, Windows PC here. And once that gets mounted and I get the drive formatted, I'm gonna run a disk speed test. So stay tuned, let's see how it does when I run that test. All right, I've got the drive connected now via USB-C to this Windows PC. And we're going to run the Blackmagic disk speed test here. And I'm getting speeds about what I would expect out of one of these USB-C enclosures. I'm doing about 830 megabytes per second on writes and about the same on reads. I, of course, have tested slightly faster ones that are kind of all in one units, you know, where you just buy the drive itself. Um, but this is about what I would expect out of something like this at this price point. So not bad. It does what it says it'll do. I really like how well built the enclosure feels. It was a little difficult to get that drive installed. And I suspect the reason why they have that slotted screw is so that it doesn't move around at all if it's dropped. So I think that's probably there to really lock it in place. So a little bit of extra work when you first get going with it. I would say it's probably not waterproof necessarily, but certainly splash proof. It doesn't feel gasketed to me, but it does again feel very well constructed and the performance is about what I would expect. So not bad here. They call this the AM2 Pilot. Okay, the next one here is called the EasyCast. This is an HDMI transmitter. It will do 1080p, although the box here does not say at what frame rate. We'll put it to the test in a minute here. And what I liked about this one is that this is a great way if you've got like a projector in the ceiling or something, you can have the receiver unit here with its HDMI plug up in the ceiling. And then this will actually work without any kind of adapter necessary on the computer side because it has a USB-C for the output side. So this is um, going to require a laptop that can output video via its USB-C port, but many do now. 
So if you have people that forget their dongles, you can just use this thing instead. It looks as though the receiving unit does need to get power over USB-C. They do include a USB cable for that purpose, but I don't see a power supply here in the box. And you do have to pair them up initially when you first get going. So I am going to um, use it with this computer here. And what we're going to look for is how well it works, what kind of uh, latency we might experience with it, and what the image quality looks like. So let me get this hooked up and we'll see what happens next. All right, so I've got the receiver plugged into this 1080p monitor. I've got my Mac out here. And this is the transmitter unit that should plug in to my Mac's USB-C port. So I'm going to connect it up here. I did not have to install any drivers. I did see on their website that they have a Windows app, which looks like it just updates the firmware for this particular product. But there you go. It looks like we are all set. And right now my Mac is mirroring the screen. It does have a little bit of latency, but not a significant amount. I would probably not recommend something like this for gaming. This is kind of billed as a business product, so you can very quickly and easily get stuff transmitted from across a room. I did test this a little bit earlier. I did go to the other side of my room and uh, the Mac was able to keep playing a YouTube video without any interruption. So I bet you within the, the confines of a conference room or a small uh, presentation space, it should be fine. I don't think you'll be able to go to the other side of the house, for example. There might be better solutions for longer range communications here, but it does seem to work pretty well and is advertised. No drivers necessary, it just takes the video out of the USB-C port and plays it back. The one thing that I've noticed here is that although it is uh, showing that I'm getting a 1080p 60 signal on the display, I don't feel like I'm getting a true 60 frames per second. Uh, this video is a 60 frames per second video and it just doesn't feel like it's running as smooth as it does on my main display here. So I suspect that it might be limiting the frame rate a bit even if it thinks it is operating at a full 60. Um, the video does look a little compressed as well, um, but if you're doing presentations, again, from across the room, I think it'll be fine. So overall, not bad here. It does do what it says it'll do. It's not going to be, again, something for gamers or home theater enthusiasts, but I think within a business environment where you want to get that PowerPoint up on the, dis the display from across the room, I think it's going to be able to do that quite well there. So looks to be pretty good here and works as advertised. And again, my favorite thing about this is that it doesn't require any drivers. So anyone who walks in with a laptop just plugs this thing in and they are off and running without any complexity or any additional dongles for that matter, provided they've got the USB-C port. EasyCast does make some more advanced products. This looks to be like their entry level one, but it does what it says it'll do. Video quality isn't great, but not bad for a PowerPoint presentation. All right, our box is now empty, but there is more stuff coming. I do these about every two or three weeks or so. In the video description, I've got a link to the live stream I was doing as I was unboxing all of this stuff, and there you'll find links to all the products. So if you're looking for something specific from this video, you'll find it over there. Also give me a follow on Amazon because I do a lot of fun stuff over there along with YouTube. That's gonna do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Chris Allegretta, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Logic KGR, Tom Albrecht, and Amda Brown. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.